Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kam Hanamaikai, Kamalani Hanamaikai, or Kamalani Keokuri Hanamaikai, however you'd like to say it. Um, uh, and so um, I'm from AT, and uh, I'm going to present some of the scientific data of corneal cross-linking, what we have up to date, and then also present some additional information from um, uh, uh, I Center that I worked at down in Provo XL I Center. Uh, with some corneal cross-linking data over the last three years. <coughs> Very quickly, I'd like to say thank you to um, my attendings as well as uh, Alicia Doxson, um, Dr. Chaya, as well as Dr. Ambadi, and um, also Dr. Parsons, who was one of my mentors in uh, ophthalmology as I was growing up through undergraduate. Um, as well, Dr. Uh, Ronald Gaster and Ro uh, Roger Steinert um, from University of California and Irvine, um, very gr I've gleaned a lot of their information over the last few years about this specific topic and I wanted to recognize them. Um, so a little bit about the history of corneal cross-linking. Uh, it was developed in the early 90s, I believe 93 was when um, Dr. Uh, Staler as well as uh, Eberhardt in at the University of Dresden began to investigate um, the technique of corneal cross-linking. This is a picture of Dr. Um, Sailor, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. <coughs> um, patient treatment began in 1998, and um, in the United States currently we are, uh, uh, that I could find we're in uh, stage three clinical trials currently with this um, technique. Um, so indications for corneal cross-linking. Um, first and foremost, keratoconus, I mean, uh, that, that uh, but in addition to keratoconus, other ectatic disorders of the cornea, including uh, um, pellucid marginal degeneration and uh, other entities like post-LASIK ectasia, um, as well as corneal melting, uh, post-HSV infections, other infectious keratitis. There's actually a, a, a paper that's very interesting about uh, the treatment of uh, um, pseudomonas keratitis, uh, if th that's refractory to medical intervention with uh, um, uh, amniotic uh, tissue grafting in addition to corneal cross-linking and then a, a corneal edema as well. Um, so the procedure itself, it's, uh, it, it was started as a, uh, what they call an epi-off technique where the uh, epithelium is uh, taken off and then after which uh, riboflavin drops are administered to the cornea and until it's uh, penetrated the cornea and you can uh, see with slip, uh, slip lump examination that the uh, riboflavin or the yellow of the riboflavin has penetrated the cornea into, into the anterior chamber. Um, when, is, when that's been achieved after 30 minutes, then uh, um, administration of uh, UV light is uh, applied to the eye for a period of 30 minutes. Um, this specific uh, dosage, if you will, of UV irradiation is, uh, has been calculated, and I'll show you some of this calculation. Um, but, but the standard of care is three milliwatts per centimeter squared uh, for a period of 30 minutes uh, with continued uh, preparacin as well as uh, riboflavin administration. Um, Postoperatively, it's managed with uh, you know, uh, topical and oral analgesics as well as antibiotics and uh, steroids. So um, riboflavin, a very important concept in the development of corneal cross-linking, um, acts as a photosensitizer uh, and it and works uh, synergistically with the UV radiation. Um, this effect m uh, produces oxygen-free radicals in the uh, corneal stroma and uh, leads to increase an increase in corneal cross-linking thereby. Um, all of the, the calculation I'm speaking about as far as dosage with the UV radiation is based off the Lambert-Beer law, which... Um, is it relates light absorption based upon uh, the media through which it travels. So in this case with the riboflavin, um, it was very technical. It took me probably a very long time to understand or even glean an understanding thereof. But uh, the, the long and short of it is that, that uh, uh, Dr. Staler works through those, this equation and uh, um, decide or decided on that specific treatment regimen as far as strength and duration. Um, in dealing with uh, the treatment of the cornea, 
This is uh, data from uh, a book uh, published in 09. It's called uh, uh, Keratoconus Surgery and Corneal Cross-Linking. Um, you can see here that uh, with time, uh, and uh, in an anterior to posterior fashion, you see an increased deposition of uh, riboflavin into the cornea, and um, that is a uh, rather satisfactory results are achieved within 30 minutes of treatment. Um, this is another important po uh, point that was developed with the advent of corneal cross-linking. Um, you can see here, it's a very easy picture to understand. Uh, were we to treat the cornea for 30 minutes with 3 milliwatts per centimeter squared of UV light, then you would have uh, actually significant endothelial damage and uh, uh, subsequent uh, a poor uh, corneal prognosis thereof. So with the uh, use of riboflavin, it's, it acts not only as a photosensitizer, but if you will, it focuses your uh, UV radiation into the stroma in an anterior to posterior fashion, just like we see here on this uh, previous slide. Um, also, I with the, uh, at the University of Dresden, they had uh, isolated a toxic threshold of 0.35 milliwatts per centimeter squared on the endoth endothelium, which would uh, lead to de-endothelialization of the cornea, uh, given that threshold. Um, this is a, uh, it's, I apologize, it's a little bit blurry, but this is a uh, information that was presented at the Orange County Vision Symposium in 2010 by Dr. Gaster. Um, and it just kind of, it explains, or rather in a, a visual fashion, explains the uh, theory of where the, uh, the effect, if you will, of corneal cross-linking, um, which he says has both intrahelical cross-linking and, and interhelical cross-linking effects post-treatment. Um, so there's a, a lot of evidence that uh, is in favor of the, the positive effects of corneal uh, cross-linking. Um, some of the first papers that I could find in dealing with this subject were uh, one from uh, Dr. Wollensack who used uh, albino rabbits to and uh, treated them pre and post and uh, measured the lamellar thickness and had a significant 12% uh, a significant increase in, in the lamellar, lamellar thickness anteriorly and 4.5% posteriorly. In addition, um, there, there's a lot of data that supports uh, this, this treatment, but uh, uh, patients with keratoconus, obviously, uh, they, this is kind of conservative data. Dr. Uh, Gaster has presented data that uh, keratoconic patients post-treatment have up to a three-fold increase in uh, corneal stiffness with bending, et cetera. But this is uh, what ca came out of this book, uh, Corneal Cross Link, or Corneal Surgery and, and Cross-Linking. Um, they, they stated uh, uh, eight point, or excuse me, 1.8 times um, in comparison with normal corneal tissue. In addition, there they've d uh, other studies have been done like uh, shrinking of corneal material based, or based on temperature, and they found that there was an increase uh, from 63 degrees centigrade to 70. Um, complications in dealing with cor corneal cross-linking um, include endothelial damage from UV exposure, in, in addition to uh, permanent keratinocyte uh, death in the area of treatment um, over several years. <coughs> in addition, uh, post-op haze is very common, which can affect the vision, and then, of course, with the, uh, the de-epithelialization you have an increased risk of infection. Um, there's also ongoing research at uh, various locations. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gaster is working on uh, kind of playing with the uh, dosage of strength in addition to time of exposure with UV radiation. Um, and Dr. Ra uh, Rabinowitz, in addition, is treating keratoconic patients and post-lasic patients with... Uh, intacts and corneal cross-linking as well. And he's shown very promising data uh, with uh, roughly two to three diopters of flattening in the cornea uh, post-therapy. Um, there's a, like I said, this is a growing field. I'm sure everyone knows that. And uh, there's lots of data and lots of very interesting data. 
Um, with my remaining time, I'd like to go ahead and share some of the information that uh, from the physicians with whom I worked uh, down at Excel Eye Center. Um, so they've been doing corneal cross-linking for the last three years. Uh, kind of a serendipitous event on how they received the corneal cross-linking machine. Um, this is a parent of a patient who really wanted their, their son to receive corneal cross-linking. So he literally flew to Australia, bought the machine, and flew back here. So I guess if you have the money. Uh, <coughs> so uh, over the course of the last three years, 84 patients have been treated and uh, 125 eyes. Um, pr traditionally, again, the uh, modality of treatment is to deepithelialize the tissue. Um, however, there is, again, there's growing uh, data that's showing uh, favoring keeping the epithelium intact, which reduces uh, corneal haze in addition to a post-operative discomfort and recovery, as well as um, a decreased incidence of infection. Um, so, uh, so they, and these are the different treatments. Uh, I, I put it in kind of a graph form. I like visual examples better. So the majority of patients treated were keratoconic patients, um, and in addition, post-LASIK being a, a large population, or rather the second largest population treated. Um, the age range here, uh, the thought of treating keratoconus is that uh, Dr. Gaster states that um, younger keratoconic patients are the best candidates for corneal cross-linking because over time, he says, if you can imagine this over time in UV exposure, uh, we receive kind of a, a uh, uh, incidental cross-linking, if you will, just by um, go living your day-to-day -day life and uh, being exposed to UV radiation. So uh, the, the focus is primarily on a, a younger age group and uh, this specific group preferred patients 40 or younger. Um, okay, so as far as uh, serious complications, they, there have been none reported in this group. Um, eight patients did have a, a corneal haze uh, post-therapy, and uh, in specific, and I just want to cut to this really quickly here, uh, only one really felt that they w had subjective visual l impairment. Uh, the remaining of the patients, uh, and I'll, I'll go back here, um, reported 91% uh, no change, if not an increased change in vision. And this is supported as well um, by Dr. Rab uh, Rab Rabinowitz's study. Um, um, this is best corrected. Um, so at any rate, uh, doc, but Dr. Rabinowitz's study is, as well uh, treated 58 eyes in, in addition, had a very wide breadth of uh, varying uh, visual acuity changes on the Snellen chart going from negative 2 to plus 8 improvement. This is from the vaccine So this is, no, this is, uh, so his study, I believe, was six months post-therapy. Post and this, this data is over the course of... Uh, uh, 22 months. Okay, so th these are uh, the physicians' theories as to the reasons for which um, adverse uh, effects or post-operative complications occurred. Um, again, these are just theories and that there's a lot of data being researched into it uh, presently. And uh, just Really quick, I want to go through this last piece of information. This is a, a, a specific case. It was a 12-year-old girl, a uh, Hispanic girl with keratoconus. And um, this is her uh, original manifest refraction with presentation in, uh, uh, on my mom's birthday in 2011, November 22nd. Um, so over the treatment of this uh, female, you can see a reduction in her manifest refraction. And um, there wasn't consistent uh, topography that were taking place with treatment, and that's something that should, uh, is actually being improved there. Um, but it, the most impressive to me is her manifest refraction um, in January of this year. Uh, she's seeing, v uh, I mean, going from 2400 to 2030 is, is uh, quite amazing. And uh, she's doing very well, very well. I've seen her a few times in clinic. Um, so at any rate, um, 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to present, and I would be happy to take any questions. I don't believe that that, that is a... Yeah, so uh, there, there's been a lot of growing debt. In fact, that's kind of one of the hot topics in dealing with colonial cost linking. Uh, I just barely read a, a recently published article with uh, 23 pediatric eyes um, in dealing with non, or rather the uh, um, treatment of cross linking without deepithelializing the tissue. And there are promising results, but it's something, again, with the advent of this procedure, it was traditionally uh, um, removal of the epithelium was just the, the standard of care, if you will. Um, so there, there's growing data. I, I believe uh, it was Dr. Ruben, oh, excuse me, Dr. Rubenfeld uh, that presented last year um, uh, at Deer Valley. He was speaking about uh, 15 different centers and, that, and uh, how they were treating with the epithelium intact and they were still showing a significant corneal flattening as well as improvement in vision. Thanks, Tom. <coughs> All right. So our next presenter is James Tucker. He's a medical MD-PhD, right? <laughs>